Do you enjoy the harvest of Missouri through food, fuel, or fiber? Interested in strengthening your community or making a difference in the lives of others? You're in the right place. This is Stand for Ag with Missouri Farmers Care. Join us for thoughtful conversations around the intersections of farmer, rancher, and consumer interests. Grab a seat, press play, and join the conversation. Welcome back to this edition of Stand for Ag with Missouri Farmers Care. I'm excited about today's conversation. Uh, you may see a common theme that has emerged in some of our podcast conversations that uh, as Shane Kinney, our guest today, just said, all roads lead back to Missouri Corn Growers Association and Missouri Corn Merchandising Council. Um, that indeed holds true today. Our guest is Shane Kinney, Executive Director of the Coalition to Protect the Missouri River. Welcome, Shane. Thanks, Ashley. It's great to have you here. So Shane and I have worked together for many years. Can you give us your background a little bit? Introduce yourself to listeners so uh, they know where you've been, and then we'll dig into the Coalition to Protect the River. Sure, yeah, happy to. I, um, I originally hailed from Northwest Missouri, Harrison County. So I grew up on a cow-calf operation in that area, a little town of Eagleville, if some folks might know where that is on the Iowa State line. And from there, went to, went to the University of Missouri and got a degree in agriculture education. Uh, but while I was there, uh, the policy, ag policy, piqued my interest through some different classes, and uh, did a, which led me to an internship in Washington, D.C. with uh, former Congresswoman Joanne Emerson. Um, so many might remember her and that legacy that family left from Southeast Missouri. So working on issues from a very different corner of the state, of course, from Northwest Missouri. Um, but really fell in love with ag policy as I worked in her office and worked uh, for the Food and Ag Policy Research Institute at, on the campus at Mizzou. And so uh, when I left college, I had a decision, was, in, was I going to go be an ag teacher uh, or try this policy thing? And um, um, Gary Marshall at the Missouri Corn Growers at the time offered me a, a position um, that you, Ashley, had just left, actually. And uh, took over from you there and working on policy. And I was uh, at Missouri Corn for about, about a decade, uh, working on a range of policy issues for Missouri Corn and Missouri Corn Farmers. And um, from there, my wife and I, um, we decided to move our, uh, also similar to you, move our kids back to the country. And so we, we went back to Henry County, which is my wife's hometown, uh, about three years ago now, and have been living there. And um, this position of executive director for the Coalition to Protect the Missouri River came open uh, this spring when Dan Ingman moved on to Missouri Farm Bureau, and I worked on river issues a lot. Um, when I was at Missouri Corn, I started in 2011 with probably one of the most historic floods yep. uh, that we've experienced outside of 93 um, on Missouri River. So I spent a lot of time working Missouri River issues at Missouri Corn, and I was interested and looking forward to getting back into policy um, so um, it was a good fit for me to get to work on issues that I'm really passionate about while uh, raising my, my kids in the country. Well, Shane, you've covered the state pretty effectively from northwest to southeast to west central. Just know if you ever want to relocate to northeast Missouri, we're a pretty welcoming people too. So uh, if you guys decide to crisscross the state again, I know you're putting down deep roots like many of us in agriculture where you are. So we're thrilled to have you back in the policy discussions. It was a momentous year, as Shane mentioned, in 2011, when uh, Northwest Missouri and much of the Missouri River Corridor was particularly hard hit by um, floods that many had um, serious concerns, had man-made implications in them, right? And so a lot of policy changes, a lot of policy discussions and a policy implications when um, we're managing something as complex at, and as important as the Missouri River Corridor and the, our major rivers. So we're happy to have you back as exec director of Coalition to Protect Missouri River. So tell us about your organization. It's not new, but it's one of those ag organizations that while not consumer facing or most people don't have a real high degree of um, knowledge about it, it works in the, in the trenches, right? Those really important, exceptionally technical um, issues mm -hmm. that are hard to solve. That I, I, I term the river as hard to solve. It's a career building. Um, it's a career building issue because it, the issues never end, right? The importance okay. and and discussions around river management never end. So Coalition to Protect the River has been around for quite a while, has been engaged in a lot of very important conversations. So bring us up to speed on what the organization has 
uh, what drove its formation and what it's been engaged in since then? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, our, our coalition is very similar to the river itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are somewhat in the background of most people's lives. You know, thousands of Missourians drive across the river daily, um, but are um, probably pretty unaware of mm -hmm. the complexity of issues and interests and how the river is managed. And so uh, our coalition was formed um, through uh, an initiative to try to bring some voices together uh, back in the day. And those voices include navigation interests. So those who are uh, trying to take advantage of the economic value of our river, um, shipping goods up and down the river. Um, it also includes uh, agriculture interests. Missouri Corn uh, was a member of Missouri Farm Bureau, Missouri Soybean. Um, and so a lot of those users of the river um, needed an organization to form around. So our voice was a collective and um, pardon the river pun, but growing in the right direction, right? Mm -hmm. And so through all of these uh, challenging issues, um, like you said, they're very complex. There's a lot of nuance. Um, they all work interchangeably, but sometimes in their own silos as well. And so we're needing to bring those voices together. Um, so the objective of our organization is really to keep the river open for business uh, for those that live and work alongside the river or directly on the river. And so we educate and advocate on state and federal policy issues um, when it comes to river management. And so we're regularly working with our U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, uh, U.S. Wildlife Service, um, as well as other organizations that work on the river. Um, our main goal is making sure that um, flood control and navigation remain the management priority of the river um, as we're navigating uh, other challenges and issues, whether that be uh, recreation uses of the river, uh, endangered species considerations, and things like that. And if you were to look at our website, um, you know, that's where we're advocating for that responsible management of the river, in addition to, you know, good management of the natural resources of the river, including recovery of end endangered species. Uh, but it's important that those are those are happening with the mindset of considering the impact to the human uses and uh, the other uses of the river. Uh, I think of this in the context of uh, Missouri. Um, you know, I have a strong interest in conservation personally. Um, I want my kids to be engaged into it. And Missouri um, is viewed as a conservation success nationally because of um, they realize early to have uh, success from a conservation standpoint. Um, that it takes good partnerships with private lands and users of the lands and things have to be um, economical and usable at the same time. And that's um, why Missouri has been pretty successful overall with that endeavor. And the river is very similar to that. Um, if we want um, a river that's open for business and good for the users and for wildlife, um, we got to be working together and consider all those interests. Absolutely. That um, speaks to the same model that we have in our Leopold Conservation Award program, that clean air, clean water, abundant wildlife is exceptionally important to private landowners, but that mm -hmm. must be paired with um, sustainability of a business model, right? If, mm -hmm. you, if you can't support the farm, you can't support the wildlife benefits and the environmental benefits that you can build right. as well. So it is very similar um, and ties in really well with that coalition building across both of these spectrums. So let's dig into just a handful of policy issues. So as you said, navigation is really important to agriculture. It's really important to all of our industries. And when I speak to counties through our AgriReady County designation program along the, the Missouri River corridor, typically their number one goal to drive opportunity, economic development, and uh, create new strategic streets for their counties is a port or some sort of access to river transportation. So that comes with a lot of policy backing, right? That comes with a lot of decisions that are um, based on that river management model. So tell us a few things that are going on. There's been a, there's been a big announcement of an, a new money invested in river funding. Mm -hmm. So tell us where we are on that and what that uh, river management is looking like at this point in time. Sure, yeah. Now, I might actually take a, one step back for a minute. Um, you know, as you think about the river, um, it's the longest river in the United States, 2,341 miles, I believe. It starts in Montana, runs to the confluence at St. Louis. Um, some geology ner nerds would argue that um, it's actually the Missouri that runs all the way, mm -hmm. 
all the way to the Gulf, but that's a, we'll talk about that topic a different day. But yep. um, in 1945, there was an act of Congress called the Rivers and Harbors Act, and that um, designated uh, what's called the Bank Stabilization and Navigation Project. And the goal of that was to basically um, make the river more predictable and navigable um, for use for shippers. And so that established a few things. One's a 300 foot wide and nine foot deep uh, channel to make sure uh, ships can get up and down the river. Uh, but it also put in place six uh, reservoirs in the upper basin. So um, in the Northern states, the Dakotas and Montana. And so those basins are used to uh, basically hold or release water um, for either navigation purposes or flood control purposes. And then in more recent decades, um, some endangered species um, issues have entered the fray with the Endangered Species Act and certain species on the river. And so that's added a, a side element to that for how that's uh, managed. And so we're working through all those issues in conjunction of how do we make sure we're providing the proper flows out of the reservoirs in the summer um, to support navigation, make sure the river level is high enough, uh, but how are we also managing those reservoirs uh, to make sure we have the proper flood storage so in a high runoff year uh, we can hold some of that water back. And at first glance, those might sound like they're conflicting, but when managed properly, they actually work very well together. And so we're, one of our main objectives is to work with Port every year on that specific issue and make sure um, those uses are being considered as well. But um, as you think about current issues, from when I started working on the river in 2011 uh, to now, it's actually a somewhat very different picture uh, for a few reasons. Um, when I was in 2011, you know, we were struggling to get funding for supporting and keeping that navigation channel open. Um, There's a lot more funding on the endangered species side, side than there was uh, for keeping the navigation channel open. And a lot of the argument was um, once we see the tonnage and the shipping on the river, then we can afford to invest. So it was really a chicken or the egg issue of like um, they needed to see that there is river use before they could spend money on it. Um, the industry would say, we need you to invest yeah. in the river so we can so we can have that reliable channel so we know we can invest. And so that was a constant struggle then. Um, and it's still, a, it's still a conversation. However, we've kind of moved um, through some, we've had some good relationships with district commanders um, out of the Kansas City district and things like that. And uh, we're now in a state where uh, just uh, this year, just in January is announced, we have $270 million of funding um, announced for the Missouri River specifically. And that money is intended to be used to fix um, a lot of the damages that happened from the 2019 flood. But as a result, we're gonna see if invested properly and prioritized property properly, that's gonna take care of many of the challenges we're seeing on the river from a, a navigation channel that's been ignored or somewhat um, let go in some places because of funding. And um, we're gonna see a channel that's in better shape than it's been in decades um, it could have up to a hundred year impact if done correctly. So we have a, a gigantic opportunity uh, with this funding and it's very exciting. We've seen tonnage come up in the past several years, uh, almost 5 million tons of cargo. And that doesn't even include uh, commercial sand and gravel, which is another 4 million tons. So a lot of momentum uh, when it comes to that. And we're very excited about that. On the flip side, uh, we are looking at a forecast of a low runoff year again. And so as we look forward and we predict what's coming down the river, we look at the mountain snowback, uh, we look at the plain snowback and they're, they continue to be below average and it's not looking uh, good to turn around. Soil moisture levels are also really low. So you have to have a big weather event to replenish those soil levels before you're gonna see a lot of runoff. Um, and so that's a concern that we're keeping a close eye on and working with the core to make sure we're managing water levels um, so yes. we can have a navigation uh, full navigation season throughout the summer. Right now they're predicting um, maybe maybe a six day shortening of that season, um, but that's something we're keeping a close eye on and working with them on. We I sat through the uh, legislative briefing recently at Missouri Farm Bureau. One of the speakers was a professional um, meteorologist and he was predicting a cooler, wetter spring and a hotter, drier summer particularly mm -hmm. with that drought persisting, which just won't let go of the West. 
which matters so much to our flows here in Missouri. So let's hope there's windows for field work in there and that it's yes. not either as hot or as dry as he predicts. And there's some easing, you know, he didn't, he didn't want to say the sky is falling, be concerned about the historic droughts of the past, but it's just not an, an easing of drought conditions that just won't let go of the West. Yes, absolutely. I was in Montana last fall and it, it was dry and I feel for the ranchers out there and, um, uh, yeah, it has an impact all the way down to Missouri. So it sure does. yes, it sure does. So what sort of, uh, tell us just a little bit, you've mentioned the core, you've mentioned the Kansas city district. What is the management structure of the river on or who are we working with on a regular basis? Yeah, that's a great question. So the Missouri river is actually contained in the North, it's called the Northwestern division of the uh, army Corps of engineers, which is based out of the Pacific Northwest. That's where the, the main office is and the main colonel uh, who manages that whole region is out of the Pacific Northwest. The Missouri River specifically, um, in the areas we work, there's actually two different core offices. One's the Kansas City District. Um, and they basically run somewhere a little way south of Omaha, uh, down to the confluence with the uh, Mississippi. And then there is an Omaha office as well that um, takes care of the Northern part of the river. And so, we're mostly working with those two offices. There's individual colonels in each office and then the colonel I mentioned before and, and the PNW over them. And so, um, you know, the Missouri River, like I said, it's a huge river and it's a big focus for them. And we've had um, a good relationship with recent colonels. Um, one actually has moved up and he's in DC and uh, we can attribute a lot of our recent funding success to his knowledge of the Missouri River and the needs. Uh, but the most recent colonel, he came in eight months ago, and we had a good meeting with him last week with some navigators, um, and he's very engaged and aware of the issues. The challenge with the structure is, um, as the Army does, we, they move those colonels on every three years. So every three years, we're learning a new uh, management at the core, uh, at the colonel level, and educating them. And then about the time we get them good to go, they, they bring a new one in. Um, but that's just part of the process. Many of the civilians stay the same, and so we have good uh, working relationships with them to keep issues moving. And on the Eastern side of the state, the Miss Mississippi River is in an entirely different core management district, right? Yeah, yep, yeah, it's in its own district. Um, and they have, I think they have up to eight different, um, they're part of an area that's eight different districts as well. And so um, there's coordination to happen there, um, you know, cause we're the flow, there's at times, especially in the drought, like we are talking about 72% um, of the flow south of St. Louis can be, of the Mississippi River can be from the Missouri River. So um, navigation flows out of the Missouri are not only important for the Missouri, but especially in low water levels uh, for the Mississippi uh, River as well. You may have mentioned this, the navigation channel on the Missouri goes from St. Louis. Does it go as far as Gavin Point's, Gavin's Point Dam or what is the furthest north end of navigation management? Yeah, good question. I don't know the exact point off the top of my head, but it's um, it's not all the way to Gavin's Point, but it's yeah. kind of north of Omaha, uh, up into Nebraska, northeast Iowa is where we're kind of seeing um, that go. And we're but we're seeing a lot of interest higher up the river in ports. You know, previously when I remember when the uh, Port of Kansas City decided to really start doing operations, so there's a lot of excitement that there's going to be shipping that far north. And now we have Omaha engaged and we have ports um, looking to be put in even higher than that. And so uh, we're getting close to getting full use of that river too. And that's, that's really exciting. That's great. So you mentioned thousands, probably tens of thousands of us cross over the Missouri River on a regular basis. Give me an elevator speech of why that river, just the transportation itself is important. What are the advantages of river transportation over the trucks and the trains and sure. other modes? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, as there's a few benefits, you know, there's many people who drive across the river, like I said, um, and they may not think they have a direct relationship with the river, but especially for the farming community, um, we're sending more opportunity to ship grain down the river. Um, and so that's cheaper than it is by truck because you're, uh, it's a more efficient haul and more grain on a barge than multiple trucks. Um, and then we're also seeing more consistency of fertilizer coming up the river um, in the spring. And so as we face all of these logistics issues that I'm sure everyone's aware with, uh, aware of that efficiency of moving uh, inputs up and uh, grain back down is a huge advantage um, to access to the market, um, efficiency to the market and some things like that. And so, and that, that ranges far outside of just the river bottom farmers. 
as well. So I think, you know, as we think about some of those advantages and efficiencies, and if you think about uh, individuals interested in uh, sustainability and things like that, if you do some of the calculations of how much fuel is used to ship, let's say a bushel of grain on a barge compared to truck or rail, um, there's a huge advantage there. And so that's why we're very um, dedicated and focused on maintaining that consistency of the channel to make sure that's a consistent uh, resource for us to use. $100 a barrel oil also drives a real critical assessment, right, of yes. transportation, of everything, costs of everything are going up, but transportation costs underlying that. And so there are significant advantages to uh, some river transportation from a cost perspective on that regard, on a fuel use perspective. So I'm sure that that will drive some additional interest mm -hmm. as Trans as if transportation costs continue to rise and fuel yes, absolutely. prices. So tell us what other, what, what are the other major issues that are rolling down the river this spring? Yeah, so one, one issue that we're keeping a close eye on is an issue, um, they're called interception rearing complexes. And what these are, um, IRCs we call them for short, uh, they're basically, um, as part of the Missouri River Recovery Program, which is the endangered species focus program, uh, it's a project, individual projects. The goal is to provide uh, basically places in the river for um, young pallid surgeon to be successful um, and survive. And so the, the dinosaur of fish for those yes, that haven't yep, had to work on Yeah, that's what they say is there's, they've been around since the ice age. And so, um, and a lot of different species of, of sturgeon out there, but the pallet is um, from the understanding is the endangered one on the Missouri Um but there's been a lot of, uh, over the decades, as you know, Ashley, there's been a lot of different um, efforts to, to improve pallid surgeon populations on the Missouri River. Uh, a decade ago, shallow, something called shallow water shoots were the big um, experiment, is what I'll call them. And so what they did is they basically made a side channel for the river that was uh, started out shallower. They thought that shallow water would give them a place to be safe out of the main current. current. Um, uh, the, the problem with we found with those is um, many times the main river flow decided to take those chutes instead yep. of the main river. And what was supposed to be a shallow water habitat, um, A, end up being deeper than the actual channel, up to 40 feet in some spots. Wow. Um, and then the construction design of them, we saw some of that water shooting across the river and impacting opposite banks, which was having an impact on you know, land loss for farmers. Um, there was some port facilities that were being impacted as well. So a lot of industry concerns, A, because of the negative impact it was having, but they also weren't doing what they were supposed to do. So no one was really winning in that situation. Um, so there's a lot of concerns with that. There's also concerns with where some of that soil was being um, put. You know, farmers were under a lot of scrutiny for runoff um, and soil going into the river and down to the Gulf. And some very high nitrogen soil was being pulled out of to build those chutes and dumped it right back in the river. So there's some a lot of hypocrisy there. We thought yes, on, there was. on management that. So that was a uh, that left a bad taste in many of industry's mouths um, on how some of these endangered species projects were managed. And so now we've moved into um, those. I think it's generally accepted that those weren't successful um, from a scientific standpoint. And now the next thing is what's called an interception rearing complex, which is in the channel. I won't get into the specifics of the design of those, mm -hmm. uh, but this is the next thing that they think may help. Um, so we just have some natural concerns based on previous experiences. Is there science to back this up that it will work or is this another experiment like the last round? Um, we can't really afford experiments that have the negative impacts <laughs> that those had. Ab absolutely. And there's yeah. some major signs that these could have impacts on the navigation channel, um, dredger's ability. They're going to have some restrictions on where they can dredge. And some of the original places that they identified was one of the, the key areas. Some of our dredgers were um, dredging sand. Many people, 75% of the sand that makes concrete in Missouri for our roads comes out of the Missouri River. Um, and so that's going to have, as we have a huge investment from the federal government to expand, mm -hmm. expand infrastructure, um, access to that sand is important yes. to make concrete. And so um, we're here to connect those dots for people that aren't seeing them and work through those concerns. Um, and like I said, our organization is not against the recovery of species. Uh, our, our role is to be a voice for 
um, those who live and work on the river and make sure that's being done um, with science that's proven and it doesn't have a negative impact on um, the core uses of the river. And so I think uh, we can get there, um, but like I said, we have concerns uh, on these projects based on previous experience and those it's something we're very focused on making sure that we get right. Shane's answer there was really level-headed, really common sense, but when you went back and looked at the shallow water shoots, this was one that made you wonder about the application of common sense, as you mentioned, Shane, right? We're taxing yes. ourselves, Missourians are taxing ourselves $40 million a year that we invest in protecting soil, keeping soil where it should be in our farm fields, not in our waterways, so that the nutrients stay where they are. And we were taking some of the richest soil in the world Absolutely. and dumping it back in that same river, um, only to be told when raising the concern that we know where soil should stay, right? We know where soil should be. That's why we implement practices like no-till and cover crops and um, everything else. We would yes. then be told by those that were on the other side of the issue that Actually, indeed, the river maybe was nutrient starved. We were doing too good of a job on our farm fields and needed some more nutrients. And so it was one that made you scratch your head and one that is good to see um, that that experiment, as you said, has maybe lived its life and we can move on to a, a shared goal, right? Yes. The shared yeah. goal is protecting the dinosaur of the fish, the pallid sturgeon. However, um, balancing those needs, those river yep. needs. Absolutely. Let's hit on flood risk before we wrap up. Um, floods are the way that probably people have the most impact on river on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. So uh, what's going on to continue assessing and addressing the risks for flooding? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and, and after the 2019 flood, Governor Parson uh, commissioned a flood working group. And his goal for that working group was, let's take a fresh look at this. Uh, we've been We've been experiencing more flooding, um, whatever the cause is, uh, more flooding annually than we had in the past. You know, we used to, we've had a lot of 100 year floods that um, come way more often than 100 years. And so he wanted that committee to take a fresh look at how we're we managing to mitigate flood risk um, and what can we do different. Let's stop, um, let's stop the crazy cycle. Let's try some new ideas. And so out of that committee came the proposal for um, a flood mitigation study. And the goal of that study is currently happening. In fact, um, I have a meeting um, at the Jefferson City location this afternoon on it. Um, the purpose of that meeting is to, is to take a fresh look at how we're managing for flood risk on the Missouri River. And what are some different things we can do about that? So we've identified some, some different sites that we can look at when, as far as uh, supporting better infrastructure that mitigates flood risk. Um, there'll be opportunities to look at those specific sites There'll be opportunities. I think a big goal for us is to also look at the um, downriver streams. And so like the Grand River, for example, the streams that are uh, feeding into the Missouri River. So um, maybe we need to do a better job of predicting uh, what's coming into the river from those. Uh, maybe we need to take a look at that. So this is, it's a very broad study. We're still kind of in the scoping phase of what it looks like, but the goal is to let's, let's take a new fresh look at this. Ashley, you've worked in policy for a long time. And I think no one's, uh, everyone knows that from a policy perspective, a government management perspective, it's common to get in a rut of we're doing things because this is the way we've done it. Um, and so I'm excited that we're taking a fresh look at this yes. and throwing a lot of new ideas out there. Um, some of them may not be practical. It's important to balance desires with what's actually practical to get done. Um, but if we're not trying to look at those things and looking for new ideas, then we're not giving it the effort that it deserves. Yes, absolutely. It's such an important issue. And you're right. New ideas are always welcome mm -hmm. at the table, right? It's a hard one. Well, we appreciate you, Shane, all that you do. I, literally, Shane, to be in the trenches is uh, often less than glorious work, right? Spending several days speaking with engineers at the, at the Army Corps or, or other management professionals. And so we appreciate you representing the interests of the river and uh, the users on the river in what you do on a regular basis. Yeah, thanks for thanks for having me on. And if anyone has questions or interests, they can definitely reach out to me. Our website is moriverCoalition.org, and we'd love uh, for more people to be in, involved. So thanks for the time. Absolutely, you, you're, it's a membership-driven organization, right? So that yes, absolutely. Yeah, so more voices at the table are always helpful in yes. representing those river issues and interests. Well, thank you. Thanks for tuning in to this edition of Stand for Ag with Missouri Farmers Care. 
Thank you for joining the Stand for Ag podcast with Missouri Farmers Care. We're excited to bring you new stories each week. We as agriculturalists have a lot of stories to tell. Stories of resilience, grit, and stories of families that are united by their passion for agriculture. Each week, tune in for a new episode and join the conversation.